As we witness the biblical timeline of end times prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes in these last moments before the rapture, the time is now at hand to begin focusing our minds on our new home that the master builder himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, has prepared for us. Last time we began a special journey into our eternal destination through the eyes of the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 21, where the Holy Spirit provides us with an enormously detailed, highly descriptive illustration of the final frontier that awaits us. Starting in verse 1, we entered an absolutely new state of existence, composed of a new heaven and a new earth that replaced the heaven and earth originally created in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. A link to that study, which is called A New Heaven and New Earth, can be found in the description box below or in the Creation 2.0 playlist on my YouTube channel. In that study, we discovered how the new heaven and new earth exist in a state of pure holiness where Almighty God himself dwells. There are no more natural and supernatural realms because the new heaven and new earth exist in perfect union with the kingdom of God as one domain. In this extraordinary place, we learn that the new heaven is a field of sky embedded inside a limitless universe with no sun, no moon, no night, no darkness. In other words, the new heaven is regulated by a wonderfully different science of quantum mechanics, where distinct and separate physical laws and properties of matter are fused together with the sacred region of paradise where God himself dwells. Let's pick up our study here and continue our journey in verse 1 to the new earth, a radically different world that is so unlike the planet we live on now that John provides us with a fascinating insight into how shockingly different and amazing our eternal home will be. And ultimately, he points to how different we are going to be. Check this out. Reading from Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, John writes, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The term earth used here in verse 1 is the English translation of the ancient Greek word gai that refers to an entire globe of land specifically inhabited by humans and animals. Did you catch that? an entire globe of land. In other words, a whole planet fully inhabited with living creatures that has no reference to water. This is exactly what John describes here at the end of verse one when he declares there is no more sea. The word sea used here is the English translation of the ancient Greek word thalassa, which refers to ocean. So the new earth does not have an ocean. It is not present. It no longer exists. But wait, this Greek term thalassa is derived from the more specific Greek term hals, which refers to salt. So what John is actually describing here is a new earth that not only has no ocean, it has no more bodies of salt water, no ocean, no more bodies of salt water. In the new earth, salt water is non-existent. Wow, this geography is radically different from our world today, where 71% of the planet is covered in water and 97% of that is salt water, with only 3% being drinkable fresh water. In contrast, the new earth is a planet made of one solid landmass, with no bodies of salt water whatsoever. A new geography that introduces entirely new laws of nature and natural science. Think this through with me for just a moment. The importance of the ocean to our survival in this world we live in right now cannot be overstated. Specifically, its interdependence with our atmosphere, that layer of gases commonly known as air, that protects life on this planet by creating pressure that allows the ocean and bodies of fresh water to exist on the Earth's surface. Without the layer of gases that create our air, 
no water could exist on Earth. Without our atmosphere, there would be no ocean. That's not all. One of the primary gases in our atmosphere is oxygen. And the ocean produces a whopping 70% of that oxygen. Far more than the Amazon rainforest and other trees that produce only 28%. How does it do it? Phytoplankton that fills the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide and releases oxygen in the same way as tree leaves do on land. By absorbing carbon dioxide, the ocean balances the carbon cycle with various temperatures across the earth. The ocean also regulates climate across the globe by soaking up heat from the sun and transporting warm water through its currents from the equator to the poles, along with cold water from the poles to the tropics. These currents regulate weather to make entire regions safe, comfortable, and fit for humans to live in. Almost all rain that drops on land comes from the ocean. In other words, without the ocean, our atmosphere as we know it would not exist. Without the atmosphere, we could not survive. Ultimately, this means that without the ocean, we would not exist. No ocean equals no humans. Now we begin to understand just how shocking the phrase, there was no more sea, actually is. Let's go a step further and compare this relationship between the ocean, the atmosphere, and our survival in this world to the new earth, a planet with no ocean no sun, no moon, no darkness whatsoever. A new domain where the very absence of all these natural phenomena clearly states that an entirely different science of physical laws and properties of matter is at work. Nature and climate as we know them today will no longer exist. The layer of gases in the atmosphere that we now call air will change or cease to exist. This means the role of oxygen as we know it will change or cease to exist because there is no issue of survival in the new earth. Death does not exist in eternity. If the role of oxygen for survival changes, that means breathing as we do now may somehow change, which implies that our respiratory system might be different. In other words, our existing anatomical network of internal organs, tissues, and muscles that enable us to breathe may all be changed, which means our entire bodies of flesh may change. Let that sink in for a moment as we connect some dots here. We know that the new heaven and new earth exist in the state of pure holiness where Almighty God himself dwells. Last time, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 explained how the new earth is a highly restricted, sacred domain of pure holiness, a place where an imperfect condition of any kind cannot coexist with absolute perfection. An unrighteous condition cannot exist in the presence of perfect righteousness. The new earth can only and will only be inhabited by new creatures in Christ Jesus. That means that in order to enter this new earth with no ocean, we must be changed into new creatures. In order to inhabit this highly restricted place of holiness, our physical bodies of flesh must be changed, which is precisely what 1 Corinthians 15 says will happen when we put on the immortal, incorruptible bodies that we will receive during the rapture. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us, beginning in verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. 
so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now we're talking about the bodies we are going to inherit during the rapture. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That's the Lord Jesus. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man, Adam, is of the earth, earthy. The second man, Jesus, is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we are born of the image of the earthly, the first Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. That's Jesus. In other words, you will not enter into the new kingdom without the image of Jesus. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, those who are not new creatures in Christ Jesus will not be permitted entry into the new earth with no ocean. Neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Now, in verse 51, Behold, I shall show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! The only people capable of inhabiting the new earth with no ocean are those who have been changed into immortal, incorruptible bodies. Not only is this amazing eternal domain going to be different from anything we've ever experienced, we are going to be totally different, unlike any sort of existence we have ever experienced. Wow. Hallelujah. I can't wait. Amen. That's not all. In the new earth with no ocean, salt water is non-existent. But even though all of the salt water will vanish, water in some form will still exist. How do we know this? Because Psalm 46 and Revelation chapter 22 remind us that fresh water will still flow from a clear, pure river with streams that proceed directly out of the throne room of Almighty God himself. Listen to what Psalm 46 says, starting in, in verse 4. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. And then Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 continues. And he, the angel, showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Hallelujah. I cannot wait to see this. Amen. 
So here we see that this new earth with no ocean or salt water is not going to be some sort of dry and barren desert wilderness. In fact, it is the exact opposite. The new earth is a solid landmass of lush, thick forests and wonderfully fruitful trees and fields that are watered by a sparkling pure river and streams that specifically replace the ocean. In every detail, everything about removing the ocean from our eternal home is literally the exact opposite of the natural world that we live in right now. I mean everything. Think about it. We haven't even talked about how the ocean is the number one source of food and protein for over one billion people across our planet. In fact, fish and seafood account for almost 16% of the total animal protein that is consumed in this world. But in the new earth that has no ocean, all of this dependence on the sea for nutrition vanishes. And what about the enormous impact of the ocean on our global economy? 90% of world trade is made by sea. The ocean is the source of millions of jobs that depend on fisheries, shipbuilding and ship repair, offshore oil and gas, marine transportation, renewable energy, mineral resources, water sports and tourism. The ocean is also the source of biotechnology and medicines that are used to help fight cancer, arthritis, Alzheimer's disease and heart disease. But in the new earth that has no ocean, all of this economic and medicinal dependence on the sea vanishes. Again, in every detail, everything about removing the ocean from our eternal home is literally the exact opposite of the natural world that we live in right now. In other words, all of the differences that exist between the natural and eternal realms is comprehensively magnified by the absence of the ocean. This truth becomes even more pronounced when we connect some other dots to this phrase, there was no more sea at the end of verse one. Follow me on this. The word sea that John uses here in our text is the exact same sea that he saw the Antichrist and his system rising out of in Revelation chapter 13, an earlier sequence of the same vision that he is having. They are both one in the same sea. More specifically, the waters of this sea in Revelation chapter 13 and here in Revelation chapter 21 that John sees the Antichrist rising out of are clearly defined in Revelation chapter 17, another sequence of this same vision, where the waters of this sea are defined as peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The scriptures are explaining how the sea in both Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 21 represents the masses of humanity, the 7.9 billion people that inhabit our planet. Now get hold of the tremendous insight that the Holy Spirit reveals when we combine these three verses about the sea in John's vision. Listen to this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. The waters which thou saw, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Note carefully how the Antichrist rises up out of the sea. In other words, the Antichrist is of the sea, of the people. The sea throughout John's entire vision represents the origin, the source of the Antichrist. We go into great detail about this in a two-part series called Rise of the Antichrist, 
The Beast Rising from the Sea. I have included links to this in the description box below, or you can find them as part of an expanded series we are doing in the Revelation chapter 13 Backfield in Motion playlist on my YouTube channel. In those studies, we discover how the Antichrist is actually a reflection of the people, a broader reflection of fallen mankind. The Antichrist reflects the characteristics, the character traits of fallen man. More specifically, the Antichrist rises out of the fallen character of mankind that is on display for all of us to see right now in the moral decline of our society. So the sea in Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 17, and here in Revelation chapter 21 symbolizes the fallen character of mankind, the moral decline of society. In other words, the sea is the satanic manifestation of increasing immorality in an evil world. So when John says the sea no longer exists in the new earth, we are being told that the origin, the source of the Antichrists, no longer exists in our eternal home. It means the fallen character of mankind no longer exists. The moral decline of society has vanished. Let's go a step further. No more sea points to the removal of the satanic manifestation of immorality from the eternal world by gathering together all of the land as one solid body. The exact opposite of what happened in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, when all of the land in our world was divided to remove the satanic manifestation of immorality that was rising under Nimrod, a shadowing type of the Antichrist. This means the new earth with no more sea completes the reversal of the Tower of Babel system under Antichrist that began with Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You recall the story. When the Holy Spirit came and rested on believers during Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they spoke with tongues of fire in many other languages. God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven heard these believers declaring the wonders of God in all sorts of languages. Yet amazingly, every word they heard was crystal clear in their own native tongue. A powerful and miraculous event that led 3,000 people from many different nations to believe in Jesus as their Messiah and be baptized. At Pentecost, the praises of God were heard and understood by many different nations as one common language. This began the reversal of Genesis chapter 10 and 11, a time 2,500 years earlier when the whole world had one language and a common speech, and the people were unified under the sinful system of the egotistical Nimrod to build a tower to heaven and make themselves gods. The Lord confused their common language so that they couldn't understand each other. Speech became the first barrier to unity for fallen man. God then divided earth by separating the land into continents and scattering the people all over the earth to become different nations. The sea became the second barrier to unity for fallen man. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit reversed the first barrier to unity with tongues that enabled different nations with different dialects to once again understand each other and come back together in praise of Jesus Christ. Now, in the new earth, no more sea reverses the second barrier to unity by gathering together all of the land as one solid body of lush thick forests and wonderfully fruitful fields.
Wow. On the surface, the simple phrase, there was no more sea, doesn't seem to mean much. But upon closer examination, the Holy Spirit uses this small group of words to release a wonderfully encouraging sense of how much higher the ways of God are than ours, how much deeper and richer his thoughts are compared to ours. And here's what's so cool. Verse 1 is only the start of our journey into eternity. We're only beginning. Hang on, because next time we're going to enter the spectacular place that Jesus himself has prepared for us. Hallelujah. I can't wait. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we lift up this study to you as a sacrifice of praise. Holy Spirit, we ask you in the name of Jesus to give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying. For the time is at hand. Thank you, Lord. Amen.